When I was a chaplain at Creation Fest, I got to be backstage with, with uh, evangelists from all over the world, uh, preaching to around 10,000 people were these evangelists, and I was the, like, kind of the water boy for them. I got them water, prayed for them. Uh, artists like Lecrae uh, it didn't let me rap. I thought for sure, you know, him hearing my skills, I could, I could no, it didn't happen, but got to, to pray for some of these artists like Switchfoot, Andy Minio. Well, there was one that really stood out to me, Jordan Feliz. Uh, his song was actually played as you were coming in, if you're on time, okay, but uh, Jesus is Coming Back, great, great song, very popular. Well, uh, on my Spotify playlist, there's a song by him that just hit me, and again, this is a guy that's the same on and off the stage, I love that about him, but his song called Satisfied, and if you want to jot that down, homework assignment is to listen to that, because I'm not going to sing it, all right, but um, the, the chorus to his song really goes well with this series out of Galatians called Set Free to Live Free. Again, it's called Satisfied. It's been on my playlist forever, and yet I, the way I heard it, like the, the Holy Spirit helped me hear it in a way I hadn't heard it in a while. It, it just hit me hard, and it fits with, the, with what we're studying today. Here's how it goes. My heart, your throne, this life belongs to you and you alone. Let there be no divide, and only you may my soul be satisfied. This, in a lot of ways, is what nails, it nails what the Apostle Paul is trying to get across to the churches he's planted in Galatia, that their hearts would be satisfied in Jesus. I mean, 1,500 years ago, the, the, the early church fathers came up with the Heidelberg Catechism. It's to enjoy God and make him known, to enjoy God. To enjoy God and make him known. For that to happen, we can't be flirting with this and, and legalism and religiosity. And we have to be, not have a divided heart, but be centered on Jesus Christ. And uh, the, the, the Galatian church, many of them were, were peppered with some Judaizers that were, that they, they were trying to um, do things in their own effort and show their own ability. Like, look what I can do. I got this. Um, I, I, and what they really got, the product that they got, the result they got was religiosity, arrogance, underground arrogance that just, you know, started to stank up the church. And it's where they put themselves on the throne and their hearts were divided rather than being sold out and satisfied in Jesus. Today's sermon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you a heads up. It's going to have a few a few roundhouse kicks to the face, a few punches to the throat punches, okay? But not from me, all right? Not from hopefully anyone next to you, but from the word of God. It's gonna come out swinging and hit hard because today's sermon is called Law Versus Grace. Up on the screen, you can see it to remind you all other religions teach that personal correction has to happen before any connection with God happens. Here's, that's, that's not true. I mean, I, I mean, that should not be true of us. This is all other religions are like, you better correct yourself before you wreck yourself. It's all about, you better do, 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 try, try, try. And then maybe Jesus will let you come into his office after you've done all a list of do's and don'ts and all these things. Here's what the true gospel says. That God connects with us first by his grace. What does grace mean? We, we, we see that word thrown around. First by grace, through faith in his son Jesus, and then loving correction begins. Friends, grace in the Greek has two different definitions. One is the divine influence on the heart. That's the Holy Spirit moving. That's giving us faith, saying we need the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us so that when the Father looks at us, he sees his Son alive in us. You have to understand that. The cross of Christ is central. What do we have grace in? It's the cross. The cro the cro we deserve that. We deserve the cross. But Jesus died on our behalf. And so the true gospel says that God connects with us first through faith in his son. It's grace. And then loving correction begins. Now with that great news, we have to be careful because here's the big danger. Is relying on our own ability to obey God. Super, super dangerous. I, I can do this. I got this. That'd be like me saying, like, okay, I preached this sermon series out of Galatians 11 years ago, which is true. I, I preached this sermon in the jail, preached this sermon 
uh, just an hour ago. I, my mental faculties got this. I got the notes. I don't, I don't need God. I don't need the Spirit. Here we go. Here we go. And I'll fall on my face. I need the Spirit of God. Otherwise, I'm just blowing hot air, just, just talking, you know, gum flapping. That's not good. So without any further ado, let's turn into the passage. And I want to give you a little reader's tip before we read this passage. Here's the reader's tip. I hope you're listening because this is a tough passage. I'm just going to give you a heads up on that. When you hear Hagar, okay, that's a, that's a woman, Hagar. When you hear the word slave, when you see the word Sinai, any of those words, I want you to think of Exodus. I want you to think of the slaves being, being freed and they go to Mount Sinai and they receive the law, the Ten Commandments, okay? So whenever you read this, I want you to receive it that way, like, oh, that's talking about this, okay? When you hear Isaac, okay, when you see Sarah, again, um, so Ishmael, I forgot to say Ishmael, Ishmael, Hagar, uh, Sinai, law. I want you to think law. When, when, you, when you see Sarah, when you see the word Sarah, when you see Isaac, I want you to see promise, which leads to a better Isaac, Jesus, so do you see it? law versus grace? Tracking with me? That's a little reader's tip. Now let's dive into it. Verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one, for a, one by a slave woman. What are you guys supposed to think about? Exodus, the law, Sinai, all that, all right. And, only, and one by a free woman. But the son of a slave woman has been born according to the flesh, while the son of the free one was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants, or solemn agreements is what that word means. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, rejoice. In other words, worship. O barren one who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud. You who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. This is the word of the Lord. And everyone said? Amen. It's huge. That's the sermon, okay? The big idea is this. Here's, this is central. This is paramount. Because we are children of God, children of the promise, through Jesus, we can abandon self-reliance and embrace Christ. So in other words, let go of, remove, abandon self-reliance, we can embrace Christ. Think of it like this. If you're on a plane and it's going down and some of you are like, Please don't use that analogy. I'm flying tomorrow. Okay, I, I, I'm tracking with you. Like if I even fly to Seattle, I, my knuckles get a little white and I'm like a little turbulence. My wife has to rub my hand. And okay, anyways, right? Okay, but let's just pretend your your plane is going down. That's our lives, right? We're going down, and and uh, and you're like, okay, I have a decision. I need to jump out of the plane. Like we're it's not gonna it's it's headed for water. I mean, it, and it's not gonna be a nice water landing. We need to abandon, or maybe it's on flames. Like you need to get out of the plane. What are you gonna grab onto? Maybe your wallet. Grab out your wallet, your keys, your keys to a really nice car. Is that gonna help you? You cling to that wallet. It's stuffed with money. I mean, the the the, the debit card you have. It's like, woo! I got a lot in the bank. Cling to it. Is that what you're gonna grab? onto when you run. Maybe you're friends with the pilot. You, I mean, you are buddies with the pilot. And I mean, as he, you guys jump out of the plane, he's like, you can hold my hand. Is that going to help you? 
No, you're going to grab onto a parachute. Only one thing. No, nothing else. And our parachute is the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. He is our only, the only thing we should cling to. Now, if you don't like that violent analogy of the plane, let's go with a little nicer one for like vacation Bible school, okay? And this one, it takes place in Othello with me uh, climbing a tree. True story, okay? Now, if my memory serves me right, I believe this was at Chris Butcher's house, my friend and buddy. Are you there? Yeah, was, okay, he's here. Okay, hand is up. I've not told, talked to you ahead of time. All right, please don't make fun of me, Chris. All right, so anyways, I climbed the tree, and I'm like, yes, here we go. This is good, and then my mom sees me. She's probably like, no, don't fall, and then um, I, I get myself up there, but getting myself down is a whole another thing. I remember like hanging on to the branch and, and then like needing my dad to come over because Chris wasn't going to help me. But anyways, like you guys ever held on to a branch and then you look down and your feet are just too far away from the ground, but your eyes didn't do the spatial understanding correctly. And you're like, no, I'm ready to not let go. Dad, help. He comes over and he's like, son, let go. Do I let go right away? Who in their right mind lets go right away, right? You're saying, but no, like a cat stuck up in the tree, right? You got yourself up there. Get your down. Come on. Um, it's, the same, it's, it's the same with Christ. Uh, and what the Apostle Paul is doing, he's trying to persuade the Galatian church to let go of the branch of self-reliance and embrace Christ. And I think of my father catching me and going, the grip of God's grace, right? It's not so much like us embracing him, it's his, we need him to embrace us. Hey, that grip of grace, but we have to let go. We gotta let go. He's down there saying, let go. Grab onto me. We see this play out. It's starting at verse 21. Look at this. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? I'm gonna change analogies on you and take it to a, med to a hospital for a moment. It, it, are, what, what Paul is saying is, are you not listening to what the CT scan is saying? Are you not listening to what the MRI and the X-ray, uh, are you not listening to the results? It's telling you you're broken. You're hurting. You need a great physician. But no, no, I just want to be under, like it's like someone holding on to the X-ray going, I went in, I was faithful. Well, are you listening to what the results are saying? Do you want to be under the law and just be under this x-ray? Or do you, want to be on, do you actually want to listen to what the law is saying? You need a great physician. You need the grace, and not the, the grace that that physician gives. What only Jesus can give. To remind you, Paul has written this letter, again, to the churches of Galatia that are not just a little bit infatuated with the law. They are they're wanting to go back to it. They're wanting to ignore the grace and knowledge of Jesus and what the, the law has been saying on like you, like a law is to be a schoolmaster, a teacher to show you your need for a savior. It's not listening. Paul's like, are you not listening to what the law is saying? And so these new Gentile Christians in Galatia are seeing these very passionate Judaizers, which are these Jews that have supposedly become Christians or messianic Jews that are sort of like, yeah, Jesus is my homeboy, sort of. I need his grace, but I really need the law. It's like, I need to help Jesus save me. It's almost like if someone, like you, you died for a moment. Someone called, called the paramedics. Paramedics revive you, and you get up, and you take all the credit. Wow, I'm glad I took my vitamins. I'm glad I've been working out at Planet Fitness. Can you tell? Huh? Right? I'm amazing. Like, you don't even thank the paramedics. You're just like, it was all me. I'm great. Yeah. And you just, like, walk out the door. Like, don't even thank the firefighters or paramedics. You're just like, yes. That's the Judaizers. They're just like, I did it. I saved myself. Here we go. And they're producing a plastic false fruit rather than real fruit. Legalism says this. It's believing, here's a definition, believing that we can please God by our rule following. How could people be so crazy? 
Maybe you're sitting there eating your popcorn. Just going, oh, man, Judaizers are idiots. How could they do it, you know? How could they be so foolish? But be careful because every single one of us in some way is relying on self rather than the Son of God. And I want to ask this question. What is so appealing about the law or religiosity or like I'm going to save myself or I, I, I got to obey? It's, it's up to me and, and, and I'm not going to be a lawbreaker anymore. Those, that's behind me. I got this. What's so appealing about it? One theory is this, and listen, listen well. It makes a person feel like they are in control. Now I want you to not just raise a hand. I want you to put two hands up. If when you are stressed out, you turn into a control freak, here we go. Just me? Okay. Oh, there we go. You got, now everyone, uh, we're on a roller coaster. Yay. No, it kind of looks like that. <laughs> right? Some of you, your, your hands were down, but you were nudging your spouse. Like, get your hands up. You're crazy. You are cray cray when you, you like, right? And you want to be in control. And, or another appeal to the law is you, you have this outward, like I, I outwardly get that certainty that I'm fulfilling and, and obeying this list of rules and do's and don'ts. And then you get to compliment yourself. You look in the mirror and you're like, oh, you're beautiful. Way to go. You did it. <laughs> when, I mean, yeah, like Ken Barbie. No, I'm kidding. But anyways, right? right? You just, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Right? You can take the credit for your own salvation because you earned it. You're a rule follower. What's the law say? We are all law breakers. There's none righteous, no, not one. Some of you are like, oh, I've, I, I've been married to my wife 21 years. I've never cheated on her. Jesus says, have you not looked with lust? To, so to look with lust is to commit adultery in your heart. Oh, I've never committed murder. Have you ever hated someone? That's to commit murder. Oh, yikes. Um, let's look at grace. Under grace, it is up to Christ and what he has done for you. We are able to do out of what he's done. It's not the other way around. I'm gonna help what Jesus did. That's why, like, it doesn't matter if the 1970s Jesus with blue eyes, Jesus of Nazareth movie, it says, it is finished, Right Or Jim Caviezel and the Passion of the Christ. It doesn't matter who's playing Jesus uh, or, or you're just reading the Bible and you read the words, it is finished. It should give you the Holy Ghost goosebumps to know it is finished. The dragon, the serpent has been defanged. The war is over. The cross of Christ is the bridge. It's amazing. And now we're covered. We're, we're, we're free. We're renewed. Under the law, it's up to you and what you can do. Can you imagine getting to heaven and they're like, well, let's see your church attendance. Or like, can you imagine if it, like it's communion Sunday, you're coming up. And I'm like, well, let's see your screen time. Okay. I got really, you guys didn't laugh at that one. Why aren't you laughing? What's up with that? Come on. Right. I, I need to talk to your wife. Okay. Let's see how your marriage is going. I'll talk to your children. Let's see how your parenting's going before you uh, take that communion bread. We got to check things out. See, that's the Judaizers. Under the law, we have to find the fig leaves to cover our nakedness like Adam and Eve, right? Under grace, we find the Son of God covering us with his shed blood. Isn't that amazing? Again, I want to say what Paul says at the end of verse 21. Do you not know what the law actually says. It's like, do you not know what the MRI is saying about you? Do you not know what your x-ray, you have a broken arm. You have a broken heart. It's actually even worse. I need to write this down. It's actually much, much worse. Do you not know what the judge, what's that called, a legal report card? That's called a, help me guys. You, okay, your rap sheet. Someone said rap sheet, of course. That's awesome, rap sheet. Do you not know what your rap sheet says? Well, according to Benton County, uh, I'm crime free. No misdemeanors, no nothing. Really, no noise violations. You have four children and chickens and a dog, and really? No, no, great. Benton County loves me. Yes. 
I'm good. Under the law, I'm not. My rap sheet, whoo, yikes. We would be here for weeks just talking about Josh Pasma, what I've done. If the prosecuting attorney, Satan, was up here, he would have a field day. He'd be like, oh, this is your pastor? You guys just sit down. Are you sure? You know? You sure you guys want this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I had someone go to the elders once and was like, Did you, I just want to talk to the elders. Did you know this guy wrestles with anxiety and he, he, he really needs to see a counselor? Yeah, we know. He tells us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways, okay. So, the, I love you, Justin. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> This is why Paul takes us all the way back to Genesis 16 by saying in Galatians 4.22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. That's Genesis 16. Do you guys understand? Like the Bible complements its, itself. So Galatians is actually talking about Genesis. I love that. That's cool. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. Paul's trying to let this Old Testament story the law demonstrate a stark contrast between the law and grace. Two sons. If one son was called law and the other called grace. One is Ishmael, one is Isaac. Now, we got to talk about the elephant in the room. The, I mean, it should all make you go, this is awkward. There's a dude with two wives. What's up with that? I'm not going to explain it. Let's move on. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Man, you sound like the media today. Anyways, okay. But um, for the record, God has never, ever ordained or promoted polygamy. That is marriage with, with more than one woman. Never, never, ever. Nor has he ever promoted and been like, yes, slavery is good. Way to go. In fact, we see in, in the garden, Adam and Eve, it wasn't... Adam and then Eve and then Susie and Sally and Debbie and it's just it's just Eve, okay? But here's what this is a very important way to interpret scripture, or you can actually there's parts of the Bible where you just read it out of context, you're like, man, look at this chauvinism. Or look at this feminine right, there's not feminism, but you know, like, right? It's it's like look at this. This is so ugly. And if Jesus would be like, You're right, that's why I came and died on the cross. And was the opposite of a chauvinist. I, I laid myself down for my bride, the church. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, Genesis 50, 20. The, you got, you got uh, Joseph who's been sold into slavery by his brothers, his wicked brothers. And now they're in a place of mercy. He's moved his way up to like second in command, right, uh, of, of Egypt. They don't recognize him at first. And then he's like, hey, guys, it's me. And they're like, oh, my goodness probably peeing themselves. I mean, they're freaking out. Here's what, here's what Joseph says. You intended to harm me, but God intended for good. So polygamy, slavery, that's how we have to interpret that. It's like what slavery, polygamy, all that, what you intended for evil, God used for good. So God promises Abraham a family line as numerous as the stars he gives him, uh, like the Bible literally describes Sarah, like he shouldn't be complaining, like Sarah, uh, very beautiful. Read the Hebrew, okay? Talk to Dr. Dave. It, it, there, it's not like, uh, Sarah, Sarah was cute. It's not what the Bible says. Literally, it doesn't even say beautiful. It says very beautiful. But because she's like over 100 years old, they, Sarah actually gets the idea too, like, and Sarah and, but, right? It's both of them. Like, like Adam can't go, well, like Eve gave me the idea. Like Abraham go, well, Sarah had the idea of this surrogate mother thingy, okay? It's both of them. He, he should have said, no, 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 let's wait. Let's trust the promise of God. I don't need another wife. Sarah, you're enough. Like God's enough. He's gonna move. It's in his timing. We need to wait on the Lord, Instead, they choose to, this is a word you need to write down, compromise, compromise. No, no one in 2023, we, we can't relate to this story. No one's compromising. That's why we're gonna just keep, continue to eat our popcorn and just binge on, on this Netflix episode in Galatians, right? And just like, these weirdos. <laughs> or actually look at ourselves. In fact, I, I, you can see this on the screen. 
what would my life be like if God touched my mind and heart as often as I touched my phone? Oh, yikes. What are some areas you're compromising? Now, I'm, I'm not just talking to CrossFit. I'm talking to the world. How many unmarried couples are enjoying the benefits of marriage without putting a ring on it? Compromise. The guys in jail chuckled when I said that. Put a ring on it. You get it? The Beyonce song. Okay. Uh, right? <laughs> Come on, guys. Jeez. No, we can have a little fun, right? Yeah. Good. Good. Just, yeah. yeah. Look at you, Judaizer. Okay. Anyways. All right. All right. No, I, I need to put myself on display for a second. Because I can sit here and go, oh, and the unmarried couples and this, and look at these sinners and look at that. But then look at Josh. And I was, I was this is, I, didn't, I really didn't want to tell you guys this, but this is my homework assignment because here's an area that my brain wants to compromise. I want to stay up at night and stress and worry and be like, oh man, if I called this person or if I, if I maybe, if, if I explained it to this person, you know, the, they, they'd write a check for the 268000 Like we still have this fundraiser. There's a temptation. I need to put on a fundraiser suit. I really need to try harder. I need to persuade a little more. No, you need to trust God. God is going to do it in his time. I just pray it's not 100 years from now. But, but right? <laughs> okay. All right. You get it. You get it. Sarah would not be laughing at it. She'd be like, that's not funny. Okay. But we want what we can control, what we can do. Now, I'm not saying, you know, just be a couch potato Christian or couch potato Calvinist that just kind of sits back and is just like, well, God's in control, so uh, I'll just sit back and wait for him to move. Instead of actually going, here I am, send me, God. And have a posture of like, Lord, I need you. Like a, sail, a sailor in, that's, that's in the dock going, Lord, all I can do is let down this sail and you, you're the wind. You're the wind. Otherwise, I'm blowing hot air into the sail in my own human effort, right? So let, let's break this down because the text breaks it down a little bit. Here it is. Um, and I'm going to use a table to do it, all right? So we see uh, on one side we have Ishmael. We have a son that is born with, with a surrogate mother. So Hagar is basically the, the live-in maid. Uh, I guess like uh, Alice in the Brady Bunch. You know, like, so she's accepted, she's, but she's not like, some of you got that. Yeah, in the eight, cool 80s rule. All right, but anyway, so I guess it'd be 70s and 80s, but okay. Anyways, legalism versus grace. And the, and the allegory is the two different sons. Now, Again, some of you might stumble. You're like, oh, God hates Ishmael. He's a racist. No. No, it's, it's amazing. If you read Revelation, it's a multi-ethnic multitude, right? We're a blood-bought people in adoption. He's gonna, it's, the gospel's first for the Jew and the Gentile. So do not misread this. The enemy would love to inject that into your thinking. Okay, but here we go. Legalism, grace. Legalism, what it does is it enslaves us to self-centeredness. That's the first slide there. The next one is grace under Isaac, the Isaac example, which, again, when you see Isaac, you're actually supposed to think of the better Isaac. Who is, say his name? Jesus. So you could almost go Jesus and Moses if you wanted to, if you wanted to nerd out a little bit, right? But, so the second one, Ishmael, born by compromise. Grace, in the Isaac example, born by a promised Miracle. Legalism, Ishmael example, inherits family discord and division. And to the first service did really good. You guys got to finish the sentence. To this day, there's no peace in the Middle East. There's no peace in the Middle East to this day because of this family division. Ishmael and Isaac. Under grace. All people, a multi-ethnic, it's everyone can inherit eternal hope and adoption into God's family. It doesn't matter if you do a DNA test and your DNA lineage tells you, hey, you're actually in the line of Ishmael. Sweet, you can actually, it's okay. It's not about Ishmael's blood, but the blood of Jesus Christ. The last one, legalism, Ishmael example, relationship with God is self Focused, it's all about you and what you can do. Under grace, it's a relationship with God in Christ, the better Isaac, and it is Christ-centered. Again, Paul is trying to wake up the church to not be focused on the wrong perspective. Ishmael was the result of unbelief 
and making your own way to God. I want to say this. Setting standards is okay. Being a disciplined disciple, very great. But as soon as you go, my discipline, my spiritual disciplines of solitude, of, of prayer, of fasting, fasting, uh, can, you know, fasting, like saying, hey, I'm not going to eat um, you know, I'm, um, I'm not going to eat for a couple days or I'm not going to eat lunch today. And instead of eating, I'm going to actually eat God's word and pray. And when I feel the hunger pains, I'm going to have pain for what God is thinking about. And, and so when I'm fasting, praying, solitude, giving, sacrificing, it is all for Jesus. And it shows us these spiritual disciplines show our need for Jesus and that, that he was there the whole time, right? So don't hear that like, Obeying is a bad thing. Discipline is a bad thing. What happens, though, is if our obeying is self-reliant rather than, than Christ-reliant and relying on the Spirit, where Galatians 2.20, it, it, it's no, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's him at work. He's taking the wheel. I'm getting out of the way. God's promise is unstoppable and irreversible. I want you to think about the even better story. I mean, like Sarah, again, is in her, she's 100 years old when she has Isaac. Finally, I mean, it's, it's amazing. But you need to remember, again, Abraham and, um, Abraham and Sarah came together physically to produce Isaac, but it was the Spirit of God creating a miracle in, in this couple that should not have been able to physically have children. God moved. I, I've met with young couples that have been married a couple years or it's been five years and, um, and they're, they're in tears because they haven't been able to have a child. They're trying to have a child. They're, they're, they feel barren. They feel broken. And it's been a few years. Can you imagine waiting 100 years? what that feels like. But again, this is not the ability to have, oh, I gotta write this down because I'm preaching this one more time, right? It's, it's about being born again. It's not, about, um, it's not about the birth of a child, right? Because the Judaizers are like, oh, you can't have children? What's wrong with you? Why does God not like you? What'd you do wrong, right? It's about being born again in Christ. That's the most important thing. And we kind of to take you to Advent, to just give you a little tease, teaser, teaser trailer of what we're gonna be studying uh, in December. We, we, we've been doing it for years. We do Advent, the, the four weeks leading up to Christmas. And there's a, there's a greater miracle than Isaac being born, Right? And there's messianic prophecies that he would come, that the one that would come would be born out of the, like out of the family line of Jesse, who is the father of, of David, out of, the, out of that line. And he would be born out of Bethlehem and that his bones would not be broken. Psalm 22 talks about that. And the government would be upon his shoulders and he would carry the cross of Christ for us that he would be pierced in the hands and the feet. Psalm 22 says this, for you and for me. And it wouldn't be a man physically. It, it would be a virgin. It would be the spirit moving an immaculate conception in Mary. Incredible miracle. But again, the greatest miracle is what his birth brings us, to be born again, to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The new birth in him. And friends, I want to tell you, if you want a miracle, you need the law of God to be written on your heart. As the worship team joins us and we begin to prepare our hearts for communion, let's get real about this. And this, this verse is going to hit us. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The enemy doesn't want you to be free he wants your marriage, I need you listening, he wants your marriage in the bondage of regret. I'm gonna say it one more time, you didn't hear me. He wants your marriages in the bondage of regret for you and your spouse to keep a, a record sheet, a scorecard 
like a legalistic miser rather than operate in a grace-filled lover. I've been waiting all week to say that, okay? I'm going to say it again. Some of us are keeping, we're we're being legalistic. We're, We're keeping score like a legalistic miser rather than a grace-filled lover. Friends, you need to repent. Don't just say sorry. You cannot, in your nicety and personality, forgive your husband or forgive your wife. You will not. You need the grace of the living God. Like, like a, someone that is addicted to drugs. I, I've seen someone addicted to drugs get off of drugs by the grace of Jesus Christ. Like, like, in that, and, and some of you are like, yeah, they need a miracle, sinner. Like, how about you? That still, you're not free. You're still keeping score. You're still, uh, the enemy doesn't want you to, to wait on the Lord. He wants you to c- continue to hang on. He wants you to just continue to take, take the wheel, take control, matters into your own hands. Self-reliance, legalism, clinging to self rather than clinging to Christ. To cling to Christ, it's like that branch, you, you got to let go of something. To cling to Christ and the grip of his grace, you have to let go of the branch. Like at Chris Butcher's house, I had to let go of the branch. What do you need to let go of? What is it? Friends, only the spirit of the living God. I cannot read your mind. Only the spirit of the living God can come in and do surgery in your heart. You need that great physician to do Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, help us. Do surgery right now. With every head bowed and eye closed right now. Almost think of like getting put under the knife and and in a sense like that anesthesia to put us to sleep before the surgery. But stay awake, friends. As your eyes are closed, open your heart to God. In what ways do you need surgery right now? If you're hanging on to the branch of self-reliance and you're compromising, would you raise your hand? Only God knows. Yeah, come on. God sees those hands. Come on, don't be, don't be shy. And what is there any area of your life? Self-reliance. Come on. God sees those hands. You can put them down. Yes, beautiful. Lord, help us, not just with hands raised, but hearts raised to you. We need you. We declare a need for you. Help friends that need to make decisions to get baptized, to not wait any longer, to fill out a connection card, to talk to somebody. People that need, in, to get, need accountability, need community to get into a life group. Lord, we need real change. Help us to read your word daily. Help us to pray all of these things, life group attendance, uh, whether we, you know, give to the church or this or that or serve or go to the jail or go to hospitals, Lord, it is, it is out of you working in us, not the other way around, Lord. So we need you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.